Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another shelf of many things, where I take a look at independent and small press role-playing games and role-playing game accessories. This time I'm taking a look at a system that I've already reviewed once, but it's out in another version, Sacrifice Branded Edition. It's actually been out in this for a little while now, I've been a little bit behind on my reviews. I'll also be taking a look at two issues of the supplemental zine, Demonic, that adds new rules and materials. Sacrifice Branded Edition is available as a PDF in a print-on-demand format through DriveThruRPG. This review will be taking a look at the PDF version, which the developer Black Oath Entertainment was kind enough to provide me a review copy of. As it is mostly a revision of a prior offering, I will try to make it quick and focus on the differences where I can spot them. From what I gather, it includes material from the original Companion, another product which I reviewed, as well as a new starting occupation, plus various fixes and tweaks. It looks like they fleshed out the text quite a bit as well, going from a page count of just under 90 to over 120. As always, I will present an overview of the appearance and layout, go over the summary of the contents, and follow up with my analysis at the end. In this instance, I will go over the core book as well as the issues of the demonic, and present my thoughts on everything at the end of it all. As far as presentation goes, Sacrifice Branded Edition clocks in at about 123 pages for the uh, PDF, with a black and white cover and black and white two color in interior to column interior with inline illustrations and tables where appropriate. Section headers are neatly and obviously set apart, as in prior version of the book. The illustrations, as well, at least where they aren't simply stock items, uh, are very consistent with a dark and gloomy style that harkens back to the primary influence of Sacrifice, the Berserk manga. In fact, it seems that many of the illustrations make a return from the first version of the cores, uh, the rulebook and the companion as well. And honestly, that's, that's just fine. It was good art that supported the mood then, and it remains so to this day. Sacrifice Branded Edition is broken into seven major parts. It starts with an explanation of what incense and iron is, followed by the basic ideas of the game. A section on character creation is the first extensive section, followed by how to play, which includes things like rules, travel procedures, and so forth. A land ravaged by war explains the setting, while of beasts and men serves as a bestiary. The entire thing wraps up with Deshrax Thousand, detailing one of the demonic apostles, as well as his men and, uh, and warriors. In more detail, what is Incense and Iron section begins to detail the Incense and Iron as a genre. It defines it as a genre that, with a centrally, clearly evil church that dominates a fantasy medieval world. The author goes into some detail as to their own thoughts and background on the matter before citing several influences. Primarily among these, of course, is Berserk, along with things like Warhammer Fantasy, Ruination Pilgrimage, safe old series, video games such as Blasphemous as Dark and Dark Souls, and films like Black Death, Solomon Kane, and Pit in the Pendulum, etc. The genre details themselves are then gone into, but if you're familiar with any of the works I just mentioned, it should be pretty reasonable to extrapolate from them. The basic section identifies the sacrifice role-playing game itself. It is a D20-based RPG where you play a branded, a being who has escaped certain death and has been marked by it. It uses a D20 plus modifier versus DC sort of mechanic with advantage and disadvantage style mechanics, critical success and failure rules on natural 1s and 20s, with some descriptions on dealing with opposed checks and assisting on checks that follow. In this way, it uses basically the same core mechanics as the original version. The character creation chapter starts with a basic order of character creation. You simply start with a character sheet, roll the basic six stats of strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, and charisma with a standard 3d6 roll. All characters in Sacrifice are human, and there are no character classes. Instead, you build characters utilizing feats. You start with a few limited options, and your characters start at level 3. And I, and I'll, I will note that although there are no so, such and such classes, there are starting professions that will give you particular rules that are kind of like half classes, really. Anyway, continuing onward, um, the uh, core sacrifice characters start at level 3, at least for branded characters. Sacrifice foregoes an alignment sort of section, and all characters start with a flat 80 silver pieces to purchase equipment from. In this manner, the character creation is very similar to the initial version. There are character types other than branded that can be played, but those are all covered later. Each ability score is listed, as well as a brief description thereof, and there are a basic ability score modifier table, which uh, is very similar to the old Beckme style bell curve, rather than the linear advancement of 3.x. Methods on customizing the character follow, with each character selecting a trait to help specialize them in a particular stat. 
branded characters uh, begin with a mark of sacrifice, which has specific d d detection effects. And there are rules for trying to stay conscious and fighting while at zero hit points. Uh, there is a luck score that can be used to automatically pass saving throws, as uh, well as a mastery dice system, which can allow you to automatically deal damage to opponents with less hit dice than you. So rather than trying to attack something that is far, far weaker, you can just flat out do damage to it. Rules for character advancement follow, with characters following a single experience table which lists experience points required, hit points accumulated, as well as other benefits. Characters generally get a new feat and skill point at each level, with some levels also granting new combat maneuvers and new proficiencies. It looks like the table is only designed for level 12 maximum. The skills are then listed with each skill associated with a particular ability score and given a brief description on what it does. This is followed by detailing what the proficiency does. Particular system proficiencies are a grant advantage when you have a particular skill. Defense level is gone into, which basically replaces the AC stat. Um, initiative mod is handled like most D20 games, and then the feats are listed. Each feat has a name as well as a brief description. These feats range from very basic bonuses to special moves, additional proficiencies, or even replacements for what in other systems would be class features. Combat maneuvers are covered next. They utilize a stamina-based system, with each character beginning with a semi-randomized amount of stamina at the beginning of each combat, with various maneuvers requiring a cost of stamina to use. These maneuvers are listed by name, their cost, as well as what they do mechanically. They range from making additional attacks to special forms of defense, special forms of attack, utilizing weapons in certain ways, and so forth. So far, the feats, skills, and combat maneuvers all conform pretty much to the original version, save with additional options from the companion guide included. The uh, weapons marked by uh, Darkness is similar how to it was in the original version. Each character, or at least each branded character, begins with a weapon starting with a few shards of darkness attached to it from encounters with the supernatural beasts. As it gains more fragments, it gains additional power as well as potential additional traits. These traits are listed in a table and are detailed in turn, ranging from special abilities to flat bonuses in certain circumstances. This enables a character to have a weapon that advances with them as they face more evil creatures. The character creation rules conclude by allowing you to create the background. A branded character starts as one of the church's agents and was betrayed by cultists or friends or other beings that sold them in exchange to become a demon. Tables are given in order to determine the circumstances of the betrayal, including reasons to join the in to reasons they joined the Inquisition, who betrayed them, why the Inquisition is hunting them now, etc. etc. There's also details on where the mark of sacrifice was placed uh, on a character that might have and what might have happened to them regarding wounds and scars from their past, some of which may have their own existing penalties, and are useful going forward as well in case they get more wounds and scars. Finally, there's a list of common names of various types. Other occupations uh, other than branded are given as well. Uh, these characters do not necessarily start at third level. Many start at first. Each one has its own set of supplementary rules, and they're really kind of designed to reflect certain supporting characters in some of the inspiring fiction. There is the Commoner, the Knight Errant, and the Tomb Robber. Each one, aside from having its own creation rules, also has its own type of background tables, although as you can see, they are generally not as fully fleshed out as the original branded because they rely a lot on the base, uh, base advancement system. There is a section on gear that follows, this details various coinage, um, as well as its conversion rates. Uh, the coins divided into gold crowns, silver pieces, and copper pieces, as well as brass pieces. Most things are detailed in silver, uh, where other systems would use gold, and, and that's that, that's completely acceptable. Uh, are there are basic encumbrance rules, which are somewhat abstracted for ease of use, as well as the existence of usage dice. For those unfamiliar, usage dice are generally a chain of dice that are rolled every time a potentially consumable item is used to see if there's any left rather than keeping exact tracks of things. And if it's a low die roll, you dump it down to the next die roll, and then you run out uh, after a d4, then, then you run out. Um, the uh, melee weapon table follows with weapons listed by name, cost, weight, damage, as well as any special properties that they may have. The weapon properties are very similar to those found in 5th edition and other d20 systems. They're described thereafter. Ranged weapons are also given a table with weapon name, cost, weight, range, damage, as well as additional properties. Helmets and armor and shields are listed in their own tables, with each given a name, cost, defense level, weight, as well as additional properties. Finally, there's a list of other gear, which 
Just so it has the gear listed with a name, cost, weight, as well as any properties and rules for that particular item in the same table. The next major section, how to play, starts with a core mechanics system. As stated before, Sacrifice uses a d20 plus various modifiers versus difficulty numbers, or in this case target numbers. A table is given with some sample difficulties as well as a basic description of ability checks. The combat rules start with an attack roll, which functions as it would in any d20 game, followed by a turns and rounds. Sacrifice uses a 10 second round which is a with a step-by-step -step procedure for evaluating a combat turn. Surprise is handled as it might be in most d20 systems as well as initiative, however initiative is further complicated by penalizing a characters for rolling a natural 1 uh, and then coming up and giving them advantage if they uh, roll a natural 20. Initiative is determined every round rather than using the same one throughout so it gives you some sort of uh, modifying, uh, modifying the character's position in combat as things go on. During a turn, a character can move uh, perform, and perform one action. Actions are listed in a general list and include such things as using combat maneuvers, using certain feats, defending, disengaging, and pretty much anything else covered in general other... It, anything else is just an other action. There's some guidelines on special combat modifiers such as wielding weapons without proficiency, dual wielding, and using unarmed attacks. Ranged attacks at a close distance, attacking prone creatures and dealing with resistant, immune, and vulnerable creatures. The critical hit and fumbles rules are here as well, with a table given for critical hits of various different attack types as a general fumble table that can penalize characters for rolling a 1. There is an optional rule for hit locations as well, which can have certain consequences when a character is hit in a particular area. Called shots have their own rules, as does dueling. It is useful for cinematic combats uh, between two skilled characters, and uh, goes into more detail than a normal combat mount round might. There are morale rules for dealing with both human as well as beast and animal NPCs, along with a table that can modify a morale check based on uh, the state of the combat at the time. Uh, healing rules follow. Each character has a healing rate, which they then get after a full day of rest. Characters can be helped with medicine checks, and a character that drops to zero hit points is not immediately dead, but rather their condition is checked after combat is finished, and wounds are treated uh, that... At that point, the character can be found dead, but also uh, have have found to have been suffered uh, from severe wounds that can take a long time to heal, and even provide permanent injuries, as I mentioned before in the character creation area. These are described in tables thereafter as well. Saving throws are described with sacrifice using an ability check style saving throw, and a number of status conditions are described as well. This should be fairly familiar to people familiar with D20 systems, especially recent ones. There is a fatigue system similar to the one from 5th edition that advances in levels up until a point in which a character just dies from exhaustion. General travel procedures are given as well, with weather and terrain effects listed, as well as a way to generate terrain on the fly for a hex crawl. There are rules for setting camps which can result in camp mishaps that attract encounters during the night or worse. And the basic hex crawl rules include exploration, foraging, hunting, and fishing, interacting with a particular area, such as a ruin or a town, and general travel, as well as checks for getting lost, or sustaining general mishaps during travel. On top of that, there's also a random events table, which can be uh, used to uh, generate certain types of encounters, as well as random findings on uh, the road, uh, which can uh, detail anything from ruins to abandoned camps to ambushes and other items and further encounters. These creature and NPC encounters uh, are given their own tables thereafter, along with a general initial disposition that serves as a sort of a reaction table. Corruption rules follow, and a character can sustain corruption by interacting with certain places and entities, as well as items of evil. A character has a certain resistance to corruption based on their level and wisdom modifier, however exceeding this will earn a character a mark of corruption. This can result in physical changes as well as mental ones, and reminds me vaguely of the old Dark Powers check from the Ravenloft setting. There's rules for experience point distribution, which is not simply based on combat, but can be earned when characters uh, use ability scores, execute critical hits, defeat creatures or NPCs, or even advance the story. There are additional ways to give an option uh, for GMs that prefer a faster style of play, but they require more bookkeeping. There's an optional rule for increasing character abilities, as well as an alternative uh, to increasing them based on the level chart. This basically results in a more organic and randomized style of character growth. Uh, there is a section on playing without a game master, which includes a sort of yes-no oracle, as well as an ability to scale it based on whether an action or event is likely or not. There's a complication table, which uh, 
can be used to determine if anything happens that is against the uh, PCs, as well as action and theme tables to help generate events in general. There's also a sort of creature combat AI uh, where randomly a creature's actions can be determined based on their existing health. A more detailed initial encounter reaction table is given for solo play as well. A land ravaged by war is the next major section and details the setting overall. Set on the continent of Naya, uh, Naya uh, once under the uh, grasp of the Krathic Empire, it now lays in a fragmented political landscape of warring nations. The Krath are detailed, followed by the uh, time of the human, uh, the human tribes of the area. Uh, there is a map of the entire continent as well as a table of various road encounters. Sacrifice focuses on an area near a couple of kingdoms. The uh, kingdom of uh, Pavaria is generally detailed along with places of interest within it, its current political organization, as well as a brief outline of its society. The Kadanor, Empire, uh, the Kadanor Dominion is also covered and is a, has a general description of its geography and organization, various places of interest within it, its politics, and its overall society. Following this, the Church of the Burning Light is detailed with its general history, its doctrine, its general structure, as well as a few major ecclesiastical orders found within it. It has its own political landscape as well and serves as a stand-in for the medieval Catholic Church. The Threat of the Demonic covers the rise of evil within the land and its various apostles of the night. The general source of all evil has gone into as well. The Hundred Years' War covers a long ongoing territorial dispute that has a ravaged an area called the No Man's Land, where sacrifice generally takes place. Aside from the overall structure, this section also details some mercenary bands, giving a table to randomly generate their name. The No Man's Land itself has been gone into in detail, along with its major towns and their allegiances, as well as rules for exploring and traveling through it. This can result in various different types of hexes than an ordinary hex crawl, as well as randomly generated settlements, a, a, a kind of idea of battlefield encounters that you can come across, wilderness encounters, and civilized encounters specific to individual areas. Uh, these particular ones can have its own uh, combat and encounter tables listed therein, you know, just in case you want to spice things up aside from the general encounter tables. There are also tables to generate various NPCs that one may encounter just based on descriptions and motivations and so forth. Weekly events are given for an ongoing campaign, since so it may take quite some time to game. This can be used to generate random events that can happen within No Man's Land and its surrounding areas, ranging from factions to natural events to general events. Treasure and rewards are covered in their own section, and uh, there are no detailed treasure tables as such. There are some general tables to generate the gear and pieces of interest one might find on various types of NPCs, rules for Mastercraft gear and artifacts, with each artifact given its own rules and serving as a unique magic item. Then, a Beast of and Men finally details the various creatures and peoples you can encounter. Each entry is detailed with the number of enemies, their morale, their hit dice, their defense level, their movement, their passive perception, their attacks, and attack rolls, their experience, their worth, and uh, any special abilities they may have. It starts with a discussion of evil creatures and spirits of darkness, since even ordinary creatures can be inhabited by evil spirits when they encounter the branded. This gives them certain advantages and disadvantages. Apostles are covered as well, being humans that have become demons. And although each uh, apostle is pretty much unique, many of them have very real impact on their immediate area. A couple of examples of apostles, apostles are given, such as Ab Abax the Beast, Arrow Steinbeck, and the Bishop of Lower Sijax. Uh, as well as the governance of uh, Baton. Um, this would be uh, back here somewhere, I believe. Um, anyway, the chapter does go into covering various natural beasts, from bears, boars, and giant centipedes, to stranger creatures such as the Ikanu, land lampreys, and so forth. This is followed by a similar list of human beings, such as soldiers of various sorts, bandits, knights, and so on. Finally, there are the monsters, including various sorts of undead, ettins, trolls, and so forth. Oddly enough, there are actually not that many monsters in this list uh, overall. It's just a couple pages long. The entire book concludes with Deshrak's Thousands. This is a sort of army whose leader has become an apostle, it includes their history and a description of their stronghold, as well as events and creatures that can be found in the area. This is followed by stats for his human and demonic allies, as well as Deshrak the Red himself. All in all, it is... Uh, you know, it ends with a final character sheet that's just given for reference. 
All in all, it's mostly a well-edited compilation of the prior rule set with material from the Companion's Guide and just generally neatened up and uh, spruced up overall. I'll go into it further, but first let's take a look at the first two issues of Demonic that expanded the rule set. Now, these are relatively brief, but I will try to get through them as quickly as is feasible. Starting with issue one of Demonic, the official Sacrifice Zine, it has a similar format to the core book, save that it has additional red highlights within the text and the cover art. Clocking in is just 34 pages, it has five major sections. Uh, the, there is St. Catherine's Monastery, Jared the Rat King, Rules Light Sacrifice, Alchemy, and the Akalian War Dancer. Before anything, though, it starts with some short fiction, detailing an encounter with an Inquisitor and some mercenaries. Once the mood is set, there's details on St. Catherine's Monastery, a monastery which is under siege by some sort of corruption that raises the dead into ravenous undead. It includes the monastery itself, challenges within it and around it, resources within the monastery, and various enemy forces. And there's various rewards for escaping the monastery with the survivors, valuable information that can be found there, as well as tables regarding encounters, reasons for being there, maps of the monastery, and uh, each monastery section is given, gone into in detail. This is done in a similar manner to the key uh, uh, to a key on the map, but perhaps not so formal in structure, so it's kind of like... It, it, it's kind of halfway between a full adventure and, and an adventure outline. And uh, this presents it as a sort of mini-adventure, but uh, then concludes with stats for monks and crypt horrors, which are just various creatures and beings you can find within. Jared the Rat King simply details a demonically influenced beggar. It gives his background as well as stats for his human and demonic forms. Rules Light Sacrifice details a stripped-down version of the rules for running in the game, including reduced ability scores, uh, just cutting them down to simply four abilities, a streamlined combat system with minimum rolls, as well as a stripped-down healing and dying system. Alchemy, on the other hand, details a new skill, giving a basic description of it, but also going into the origins of it, the relationship of the church, of the, of the burning light to it, as well as various secrets that one can uncover while studying it. It details a sort of evil's fury that enrages creatures of evil alignment against those who use alchemy, rules for gathering ingredients along with a table of them, details on various alchemical uh, tools, and then concoctions for what they do in a large table. There are more detailed rules for those who prefer a finer rule set, including uh, finding methods for application and adding uh, to an alchemical base as well as how potions can be compatible or not in an, a, what is effectively a potion miscability table. The final section details the Akelian War Dancer. It gives background on Akelian society and its traditions, and especially the War Dancer, which is an elite warrior class. After going on this background and some name conventions, it does give information on playing an Akelian War Dancer, similar to the other occupations detailed before. On towards Demonic Issue 2, uh, in format it takes much the same structure as its predecessor, except that this time it clocks in at around 40 pages. Issue 2 has uh, four major sections, detailing Lucius Voss, a fallen inquisitor, the Arcanist, Servants of Darkness, and the Pig Witch. Again, this issue starts with a short story and it dives into Lucius Voss, a demonic apostle. His uh, background has been gone into, followed by his stats in both human and demonic forms. The Arcanist is then covered along with his a uh, background in the nature of magic in general. Prior to this, magic users were not actually playable in Sacrifice, so this class details an entirely new style. It gives rules for the creation of the character, and which does not have access to combat maneuvers or stamina to use them. Rather, the Arcanist uses spellcasting. Spellcasting rules are gone into, uh, where, the, where concentration takes the place of stamina. Incantations are spells cast on the fly, uh, while rituals are more involved and require a lot more time and material components prior to casting them. There is the danger of demonic backlash during casting, rules for saving throws that arise from incantations and rituals, the duality and demi arcanus method for creating half-casters, um, and then a list of incantations. There's a table to uh, randomize them, uh, but otherwise each incantation is given a name, a cost, a, a cost in concentration, and then the description of what it does. Ritual spells are more involved, with ten of them listed overall. Uh, each contains the name of the effect it produces, its casting time, and its description. Finally, there's some spellcasting uh, feats, which are uh, given purely for spellcasting characters. The Servants of Darkness section fleshes out characters who begin to succumb to the darkness within. It includes dark blessings and details various demonic thralls and a steed of darkness creature, as well as demonic artifacts that may be discovered during play. 
Rules for followers are included and can be that can be attracted to a demonic individual once they have embraced the darkness, as well as blessings that their followers can get. There's even a table of adventure seeds for characters who are on the track to become apostles. The final section of issue two is a pig witch, an adventure that in contains a series of encounters around a farm. The farm is, of course, tainted with evil. There are rules for the encounters in the surrounding woods, as well as stats for various adversaries, including pig beasts, dark inquisitors, pigs in general, and a pig witch herself, uh, the pig witch herself, as well as her curses. Once more, this issue finishes with a character sheet. This one focused on arcanists, so you get a spellcasting sheet as well. So what do I think of everything? Well, as for the base game itself, it is, as usual, well-written and well-edited, with additional material from the companion book integrated seamlessly into the main rules in a rather surprisingly effective manner. I am still quite a bit of a fan of this game. Uh, I've found it one of the closest to duplicating the feel of the Berserk manga without actually being set in that exact world. The adaptation of the D20 rules is done efficiently and is streamlined enough that even though the implementation of the stamina system with specific maneuvers it, 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 even though it's got that, it doesn't run any slower than your average OSR system. I do appreciate the existence of non-branded characters to make for a more diverse party, similar to the one you might have seen in Berserk. My initial complaint back in the day was that there was no magic system involved. It is still the same with the core rules, however, the issues of demonic that follow certainly do alleviate that. As for the core rules, I still highly recommend them, and if anything, I would recommend this version over the prior version if you're still interested in the system and haven't picked it up. If you already own the prior version and the companion rules, it's a bit more of a hard sell since you by and large have the vast majority of the material already at hand, it's just this one compiles it better. On towards Demonic, issue 1 is not bad. It, it introduces a few good antagonists that can be used in a variety of playstyles. I am less enthused with the Achillean War Dancer, although that's just personal preference, and I can see where a number of players may enjoy playing that sort of warrior and, and may really love it. However, issue two, issue two I find almost indispensable. Aside from the usual mini-adventure and a potential opponent who in my opinion is more useful and effective than the ones presented in issue one, issue two presents the magic rules, which I've been waiting so long to see, as well as rules that may not be useful for every group, those of who are playing the apostle style characters are really going to love this one for an evil group this apostle this apostolic path is very valuable and it may even find use in an ordinary mixed group because of the great sort of morality that the characters can are generally going to encounter while playing the demonic artifacts themselves would be useful in any situation simply to tempt characters to use their power i found the arcanist very well written and it treads that line between different types of spellcaster well enough uh, it's adapted. To, it can be used to adapt someone like Sherky or someone with a more studious and structured background alike. The uh, magic rules. Well, I I found the core rule as well as I found the core rules. I just can't help but think that the magic rules in Demonic 2, as much as I like them, I I feel like they could be fleshed out a little bit more given time, uh, given more space than a simple zine can provide. Uh, that's not saying they're bad. That's not saying they're bad, that's just saying that I feel like they could have been better, and I know that's kind of a nitpicky thing to say, but that's how I feel like it. For a first release, this magic system will certainly get the job done and not feel out of place compared with the other rules. And I am always impressed with the internal consistency which this magic rep system represents because it does appear to be a adaptation that is different but very compatible with the core rules, which you don't always get in when you're adding a new system to an RPG. Taken as a whole, I believe that Demonic Issue 2 is almost a must-buy for anybody interested in the system. If anything else, it feels more necessary than the initial companion book did in the first release of the rules a couple years back. For fans of the genre, Sacrifice, Branded Edition, and to a lesser extent its expansions in the Demonic Zines, will provide a very effective way to play games similar in theme to Berserk and related settings. It is clean, well-written, atmospheric, and the rules are easy to understand and quick to play. And I can't really ask for more than that. So I will wrap things up here. This has been the RPG Crawler with my review of Sacrifice Branded Edition and the first two issues of the Demonic Zine. As always, I will put links below where you can pick them up. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content. Until next time, take care and goodbye. And if you are still watching, I would like to take the opportunity to thank my supporters, the top tiers of which are listed on the screen, without whose support I would not have been able to offer the variety of content that I have on this channel throughout the years. 
If you're feeling particularly generous and would like to join them, you can support the channel. Uh, there are a variety of options to do so. I have a Patreon, a Subscribestar, as well as channel memberships enabled. If you are not in a position to contribute, simply leaving a like, a comment, or sharing my videos are all wonderful ways to help the channel grow without spending a dime and are all greatly appreciated.